Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is October 26th, 2022. This is part two of a series I'm doing on the book of Romans called The Obedience of Faith. <clears throat> and I had forgotten, but it's very interesting that that phrase, the obedience of faith, occurs not only in Romans chapter 1 verse 5, but also in the second to last verse of the book of Romans. The last three verses read this. <clears throat> now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Those last three verses contain so much that I could actually speak for an hour on them. Paul revealed the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, was never known to anyone what God would do with respect to reconciling men to himself. And Paul disclosed it, made it known through the prophetic writings. That is, he made it known through the scriptures. And so, <clears throat> in the book of Romans, Paul quotes many, many scriptures that tell, that prophesy what God did in Jesus Christ. And I had planned to get through the first eight chapters of Romans in one uh, sitting, one teaching. But I realized after I did the first one, <clears throat> it took me uh, 42 minutes to do the first three chapters, and I really went too quickly. And I'm going to um, go over a few points that I want to um, make very clear. But we will spend uh, all of today's video on just chapter 4 of Romans. But first, let's do a short recap of the first teaching. <clears throat> There's about six points that I really want to um, bring home. <clears throat> the first one is that Paul, in chapter 1 of Romans, he names the common sins of humanity. Um, he basically starts in verse 18, where he says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And the leaders of this world suppress the truth. They do not tell us the truth about the world we live in. Then in verse 28 and 29 through 32, he says this, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. That describes the men of this world, and it still does. It did then, 2,000 years ago, and it does today. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And that's true because when people practice evil, they like to get others on board with them. I'm turning up the volume a little bit to be sure 
this is clear. Um, so the first point is God names all the sins of humanity. Paul names them. And then right away, he denounces those who judge people who do those things, but yet do the same thing. So what he's doing is he is judging the hypocrite. And how many Christian or religious hypocrites do you know? People who claim that they're Christian and they won't do certain things like, for example, uh, sell alcohol at their uh, grocery store. But they might indulge in... Uh, uh, well, they consider that a sin, first of all, and, and to just drink wine or alcohol is not a sin. But they will have a pet peeve that they will avoid, but then they will partake of other sins, and it won't hurt their conscience at all. So Paul says in verse 1 of chapter 2, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. And that draws my attention to a video I want, uh, want you to watch. Dana Coverstone, a uh, Assembly of God pastor, God has given him many prophetic dreams over the last three years. <clears throat> and he had one that he posted a few days ago called the Halloween Dream. And it has to do with people wearing masks in church. And that is a sad reality. People put on their Sunday best, put on their Sunday face, their smile and everything else, and act and pretend like they're living a righteous and holy life, when in reality, a vast number of Christians do not practice what they preach. <clears throat> this is coming to an end. God is bringing this to an end. We live at the end of this age. And you need to understand that. There is no more time to be messing around, pretending that you're a Christian when you're not. There's no more time left to pretend that you're something you're not. You have to take off the mask now. You have to live by the obedience of faith. The third thing that we see in the first three chapters of Romans is that the law is the embodiment of knowledge and truth. That's uh, chapter 2, verse 20. And then the law gives us knowledge of sin. That's in Romans 3, verse 20. Paul is going to get very much into the law as we proceed with this, uh, but not in chapter 4. But it's important to look at the times that the law is mentioned because a lot of the problem the world is in is because the church derogated and derogates the law. <clears throat> Paul never does. Fourth point is, outward works like circumcision do not win God's favor. So he's, he's being very clear that your religious works don't cut it. They're not going to win you any favor with God. And they're not going to make sure that you get to heaven. I mean, there's people who haven't missed church in 40 years. And they wear that as a badge of honor. God doesn't care. Why do you think going to church means something?
The only thing that matters is the obedience of faith. So, in talking to the Jews, Paul said, your circumcision doesn't matter if you're not walking in accordance to the obedience of faith. And then, that was Romans 2, verses 28 and 29. And right there he says, A true Jew is a person who has allowed God to write his law on his heart. And if you look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, to one of the letters to the seven churches, the letter to Smyrna, there are, well, let's just read that. Revelation chapter 2. Verse 9, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. This does not necessarily speak of a Jewish synagogue. It could be talking about a church. People who say that they're Jews and are not, that would refer to Christians who say that, that they're Christians and are not because they're hypocrites. A Jew is not a Jew outwardly. A Christian is not a Christian outwardly. But a Jew is one who has had a circumcised heart. That's what the whole idea of circumcision is about. That our heart would be circumcised, that the flesh of our heart would be cut off and that we would no longer act in fleshly manners. And that's what the new covenant is about when God said he would write his law upon our hearts and upon our minds. But we have to be willing to let him write his law upon our hearts. The church often will speak badly about God's law. And the last thing they'll ever teach you to do is to allow God to write his law upon your heart because the law has become a dirty word. And then the sixth point from the first three chapters is that our righteousness doesn't come by our good works. None of us will be declared righteous because we did everything right. It only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And there in Romans 3.25 we have the verse that says, God put forward Jesus as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. <clears throat> a propitiation is a two-part act. The first part appeases the wrath of an offended person. So here, Jesus, by his crucifixion by the shedding of his blood he appeased the wrath of god against mankind the second thing a uh, second part of propitiation it reconciles the offender to the offended person the important thing to understand is this is that jesus was god in the flesh I am, and Jesus was I am. Remember um, the book of John. Have you seen Abraham? And Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. So Jesus was I am. He humbled himself by taking the form of a mortal man. He came in the flesh. 
Romans 3.26 says, It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Okay, this is God. God shows his righteousness so that he might be just. He is a God of justice. He is a God of righteousness. But not only is he just and righteous, he is the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That means he makes them just as if they had not sinned because he accepts Jesus as a propitiation. That sacrifice of Jesus satisfied the wrath of God because sin brings wrath and it reconciled us to God. And finally, why was this necessary? So seven major points for the first three chapters. Because, says Romans 3.23, all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us is a sinner. And we do not stop sinning even after we become Christians. If we will come into agreement with God to the obedience of faith, then we will begin to put down sin in our lives. And we will get into that in uh, later chapters. So I don't want to get ahead of myself because we're going to follow what Paul is saying in the book of Romans. So now we're going to go to Romans chapter 4. Romans 4. <clears throat> what then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. I wonder, well, why did Paul say that? Well, it's because God is perfect. So even if you are perfect, you can't boast before God because God is perfect. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to or counted to him as righteousness. So it's an accounting term. It's like an exact this for this. Abraham believed God and so in the book of accounts in heaven, God accounted Abraham as righteous because of faith. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due, right? And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So God is not paying us wages of salvation because we worked out our spiritual salvation. God is accounting us as righteous, bringing us into relationship with him by faith. And even this is not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. David speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. He says, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. So here's one of those prophetic verses. This comes from the Psalms. And these are the things that no one understood until the time of Christ. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. So Jesus, by his blood, atones for our sins. That covers our sins. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Verse 9. 
Paul asks, is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. <clears throat> the purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. So this God accounting Abraham as righteous came to him before he was circumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And, <clears throat> and to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. <clears throat> so Paul is talking to the Jews here, to people who became circumcised because of their faith or because of their religious practice. But he's making it clear that you also have to walk in the faith Abraham walked in. For the promise to Abraham and his seed that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. In other words, if this only applies to the Jews, you know, the Jews of Paul's day and to the, the ancient nation of Israel, or even to the Jews, the descendants of the Jews today, then faith is null and void. <clears throat> For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transget transgression. That is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all Abraham's seed, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Of all who? Of all people of faith. Abraham is the father of the people of faith. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, Abraham believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. <clears throat> now that is a quote from Genesis chapter 15, verse 5. And this is why we're not going to get out of the fourth chapter today, because now we're going to go and we're going to read at least two chapters out of Genesis, because we need to understand what this is talking about. What does it mean? So shall your offspring be. You know, he's not explaining it. We need to go and find out what that is. So in chapter 15, we have this. Verse 1, after these things, the word of I am came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, oh, Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, no seed, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of I am came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. <clears throat> and he brought him outside and said, Look, Look toward heaven 
and number the stars if you are able to number them. Have you ever tried to do that? Have you ever begun looking at the stars? When you begin looking on a clear night, there are so many stars that you simply can't stop numbering them because the more you look, the deeper you see, the more stars you see that you simply can't number them all. Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then God said to Abram, so shall your offspring be, or so shall your seed be. Well, that was what was quoted in the book of Romans by Paul. So what he's saying is, to Abram, is that your seed is going to be limitless. You can't even count how many seed you have. There's going to be so much seed that comes from you. And then verse 6 says this, And he believed I am, and the Lord counted it to him as righteousness. <clears throat> Now, there is a, um, further promise that comes here, and I think I'll go ahead and read it because it's good to have these things in our hearts to, uh, and to understand more of what God did. And God said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. And he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, Dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then I am, said to Abram, know for certain that your seed will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. This is, this is talking about when his descendants went into Egypt and they were afflicted by the Egyptians. But I will bring judgment on that nation that they serve and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, I am made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your seed I give this land. From the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, who were giants, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. This was the land of Canaan. And so this was where the promise came to Abram that he was going to give that land to his seed. Now, the next chapter, you have um, an event that is discussing the flesh, what the flesh does. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And... Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So, <clears throat> we all in the flesh, you know, we all have to put up with and listen to the voice of the flesh. We have to learn to discern what is the fleshly voice from what is the spiritual voice and learn to walk in the spirit. Abram did not do that here, and so... Sarai's servant became pregnant. She had um, 
a son who's named Ishmael. And so verse 15 of chapter 16 says, And Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Now, Abram believes at this point, he believes that Ishmael is the promised son, and that's what that's who he thinks is going to inherit everything. So then we have 13 years later, chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, I am appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. <clears throat> I don't think there are any other people in the scripture to whom God revealed himself as much as to Abraham, to Abram. The only other one I can think of that would be similar might be Moses. But in these chapters of Genesis, you have God appearing to Abram multiple times. So here he is, he's 99 years old. Verse 3, Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. Ham. So God is adding the sound, the ruach, the spirit. So Abram is becoming a spiritual man here. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Back at verse 1 of chapter 17, when God first appears here to Abraham at this time, he says, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. That command has not changed. That's what he wants. He wants us to walk blamelessly before him. But the reality is that we cannot walk blamelessly, and Paul will get more into that in the next few chapters. But that's what God is looking for, are people who will walk in righteousness, in justice, and in holiness before him. So 17 verse 9, And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your seed after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any circumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Well, this was 14 years after God had accounted 
Abram as being righteous. Way back up in chapter 15, before he went into Hagar and had the son Ishmael. So now, after 14 years, God gives now Abraham the sign of circumcision. Now verse 15, And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah, ah, so he adds again the sound of the spirit, the Ruach, here to Sarai's name. Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to him, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Of course, he loves Ishmael. He's his firstborn. But God said, No. But Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. So Ishmael is the father of the Arabs, the Arab nations, and they're still there in the Middle East today. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. So God gives Abraham the sign of circumcision and then the renewed promise that he's going to have a son. Then verse 22, when he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael his son and all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house. And he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day. He immediately obeyed God, just as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael his son was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised. The very day that God spoke to him. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he believed God this very day and acted upon that faith. The obedience of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And all the men of his house, those born in the house and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. So every single male, eight days old and older, were circumcised in Abraham's house. Okay, now I'm going to go back to Romans chapter 4, and I'm going to begin at uh, verse 13. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his seed, not only the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. The father of all of faith. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. And we just read that. Again, that was quoted from Genesis. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. 
In hope he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. And that's what he was told 14 years before this uh, event we just read in Genesis chapter 17. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old. That's how old he was when God appeared to him at this particular time. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief. See, he, we knew that, he knew that he was not impotent. He knew that he could have a child, but Sarah had not been able to have a child. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trans trespasses and raised for our justification. So, this says that when we believe, really believe that Jesus died for our sins, that he was the propitiation for us, that faith is counted for righteousness. We become righteous before God. Our standing before God then is a standing of righteousness. Now this is very important. First we need to understand what, what does it even mean to be righteous? Well in the Old Testament you constantly have the words justice and righteousness occurring together. They are the foundation of God's throne. The foundation of God's throne, the foundation of his rule, the foundation of his authority is justice and righteousness. Righteousness defines that relationship we have with God. Righteousness describes the character of God. And then justice describes applying righteousness to the earth. In the book of Isaiah, <clears throat> it says righteousness is the plumb line, up and down. That is God and man. God wants us to be righteous like he is. And justice is the measure, the tape measure, the measuring line that goes out horizontally, plumb line, vertically. So our relationship with God creates a relationship of righteousness. And then we take that righteousness as we learn righteousness and we apply it in the earth in justice, equity, fairness. Justice is applied righteousness. So we will end this today at this point and we'll begin uh, with Romans chapter 5 next take take this seriously 
The prophetic dream that Dana Coverstone received just last week was a dream of people in church wearing masks. In the dream, in, in the words of the Lord to Dana, and I think I have those written, let me see. At the end of every dream, God appears, Jesus appears and gives instruction. The Lord said, as I expose the truth, you will be given the chance to take your mask off. Have you taken your mask off? As God exposes truth and you receive truth, you can take your mask off. If not, Jesus said, if, not, if you don't take your mask off, Jesus said, your circumstances that are coming. I mean, we live in dire times. We live in the time of the tribulation. If not, if you don't take your mask off, your, circumst your circumstances will tear them from your face and take your eyes with them. You will not be able to see. Does it mean literally? Or does it mean you will have no understanding of anything? You will not be able to discern anything. So while you can discern, while God is exposing the truth, you have a chance to take your mask off. If not, your circumstances will tear them from your face and take your eyes with them. You that know the word, know better. So if you know the word, you know better than to have a mask on. And you that never studied my word will stay dressed in a costume and miss heaven because you chose to remain in ignorance. Even if you hide from the truth, it will confront you, and it will confront you to the front of your face. And then Jesus turned to Dana and said, it's not too late to warn the body. Pastors, it's not too late to warn the body, as there are still many who will hear it, but woe to those who refuse to listen at this point. <laughs>